Good morning. Oh man, good morning. So glad you're here. Welcome. I'm Pastor Michael Jarbo. If this is your very first time in the journey, welcome. Thank you for giving us a try. If this is your church home. Welcome back. It is so good to see you. I hope you were greeted warmly and welcomed. Grab one of those bulletins on the way in because there's a lot of information going on in the life of our church as we're moving into February, as we're moving, not February, March, and we're moving into March and we're moving into the season of Lent. There's a lot of good stuff to keep involved with. So I just want to encourage you to make sure you stay involved with all going on in the life of our church. I'll tell you, I, I, it's hard with those children moments. So I'm kind of back in the back so I can't see the screen since we kind of moved the screen a little bit. But uh, when I hear the kids yelling, no, about toys, um, if, if it's hard for them, this scripture is going to be hard for us. Uh, buckle up, because we are talking about loving our enemies today in Luke's gospel. We're in a series, and we're in the third week of four weeks. We'll wrap it up next week before we move into Lent, called Why Are We So Angry? And it's been fascinating, the responses I've gotten from folks about the sermon series. One of the most popular was, it needs to be eight weeks to work on the anger I've got. And it's like, whoo. Yeah, what, what is that? Where does that come from? How's it stemmed? Well, we see some great images in Luke's gospel, which we're going to be traveling through the rest of this spring up until Easter. And uh, we're in Luke chapter 6 today. And I want you to hear these words Jesus tells all these folks gathered around him. We talked last week about the Sermon on the Mount. We call it the Sermon on the Plain because it says Jesus in Luke's gospel was on a plain field. And he began to preach. He began to talk. Got on their level and spoke to them. And so we hear some more words, and they're not easy, but they're words we can try to live by. So, again, Luke chapter 6. If you've got your Bible, gold star. There's stickers at the front. Snag one, put it no. But you should bring your Bible to church, by the way. If not, no worries. The words are right here on the screen. Yeah. Follow along that way. It's awesome. Again, I'm really glad you're here. This is Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36. Hear these words. Jesus says to them, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. If you, anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to them, Excuse me, if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This, my friends, is the word of God for us, the people of God. And together we all say, thanks be to God. Amen. And amen. At the end of last week's scripture, Jesus seemed to be on the verge of like a a social revolution, right? He had just said something called the Beatitudes. He said these words, blessed are those of you who are poor, who are hungry, who are despised, who are distressed. And then he said, woe to you. Woe, we don't use the word woe enough in our society. Woe to you who are rich, fat, and happy, and famous. And the crowd that was gathered around there, if you remember, they had come from a long way and they were hurting, ailing people in need of help. So they were probably, most of them, poor as well because they didn't have the proper medical attention they needed. So when they heard this word from Jesus, this must have been good news for them. It sounded like Jesus was saying to them, 
Both of you are going to get what you deserve, but the rich are going to get what the rich get, and you all are going to get something completely different. It sounded like the start of a revolution. And those who were gathered there right by Jesus' side must have said, I want to start that revolution right now. I can almost see them, can't you? Like, I can almost see them picking up sticks and, and, and rocks off the ground. Right? Those who had swords might have pulled them out from their sheaths because Jesus could announce at any moment the start of a revolution. And when he did, they wanted to be ready. They wanted to be ready to rush into the inner city to pull the high and mighty off their thrones and lift up the poor and the lowly. And can't you see it? Leaning in towards Jesus, testing the weight of the rock that was in their hand, slapping that heavy wooden stick in their hands. You can almost hear them whispering, say it, Jesus. Come on, just say the word. And in that moment, Jesus says, but I tell you who listen to me. I tell you who hear me. Oh, and they can hear him all right. They're right up next to him. Their ears are cocked towards the sound of his voice. Just say the word, Jesus. Just say it. Their swords are raised. The rocks in their hand, they grip harder. Stones are about to be thrown and hurled. And Jesus says, love your enemies. And they run towards the city, whooping and yelling and singing and swinging their swords in the sky. And suddenly they stop in their tracks and someone says, what did he just say? I want to know the Greek for say what? Say what? They turn around and trudge back to Jesus, their swords dragging on the floor, their clubs hanging by their sides. Stones held loosely in their hands. Excuse me? One of them probably said, what did you just say? Love your enemies. Jesus said to them, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. And if I was one of those standing there, I would have said something like, could you be a little bit more explicit, Jesus? And Jesus says, certainly. And he goes on to say these words, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer them the other also. Are you listening to these words? Offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. He's like, if they take your coat, give them the shirt too. Give to anyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, don't ask for them back. In other words, do unto others as you would have them do to you. Sometimes called the golden rule. Heard that before. Now I gotta interrupt the story briefly and let you know that this golden rule that Jesus tells to them was not original to Jesus. It's been found in the writings of writers like Homer and Seneca and Philo, people who wrote far before Jesus. But my guess is that in Jesus' time, it had to have been long enough out there in the world to kind of get domesticated, if you know what I mean, right? In the same way that phrase has sort of become domesticated to us. When we say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, don't we really mean like, be more nice? Be nice. Like, uh, like, don't we mean by that, like, open the door for someone who has a bunch of groceries in their hands? Or, 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 open up your umbrella next to an older person who's walking across the street in the rain. Those are nice things. But that's not what Jesus is trying to say here. In fact, he gets a little bit more explicit in the next section of the passage. He says this, I'm going to read it to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive just as much, but love your enemies. Second time he said it. Do good and lend expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful, to the wicked, be merciful, just as your father is merciful. Now, 
Do you see what Jesus is doing here? It's important. I know I read the whole passage again, but it's important. Because he's setting up this dichotomy between people. He's saying, there's some people who do good just because of the reward they expect to receive, right? And then there's those people who do good because that's what their father has done for them. God is kind to the ungrateful, to the wicked, Jesus says. So be more like that. You don't have to just be more nice. Be more like your father in heaven. Be more merciful. The word merciful uh, in the Greek is the word oiktirmon, oiktirmon, and it better translates into English into the word compassion or compassionate. So in a way, you can read this statement here at the end of the passage saying, be compassionate just as your father in heaven is compassionate. And I think it's an important distinction because mercy sometimes, we think about mercy in terms of like a, a, a superior might tell their subordinate at their work, like, hey, you messed up here, I'll let you off this time. Like mercy. But compassion means to literally feel with the person you're with. It's a visceral sharing of someone else's pain so that you suffer along with them and you'll find yourself, when you do, move to do something even more. This, says Jesus, is what God is all about. God does this. God feels the pain of the wicked. God feels the pain of the ungrateful. And when he feels their pain, when he shares in their sufferings, God is moved to do something about it. And so there is a distinction. So maybe we need to hear it as that. Be compassionate, Jesus says, just as you, your father is compassionate to you. Love your enemies, Jesus says. Of all the things I think Jesus asks us to do as followers of him, this may just be the hardest thing we got to do. Because let's be real, shall we? We live in a world that is... Um, that kind of breeds this idea of, that we have to have an enemy. Right? I mean, think about Disney movies when we're really young at some age. Right? The villain. We know the villain. It, it, it makes us big. Like this recent movie Encanto. Right? They're like, like, who's the villain? We don't know. It made the news. Right? Because people know who the villain is in the movie. Then we get older and get into our youth group. Oh, people in high school, middle school. Right? That's where it's tough. Bullies, cliques, uh, ever-changing relationship status of teenagers. One day you can be someone's BFF, and the next day you can be sitting alone at the lunch table. But let's get even realer, shall we? Realer is not a word, is it? It's not a word. No, Becky's shaking your head. No, realer. More real. No, I'm going to say realer. Realer feels right right now. Realer. Let's get realer, right? It doesn't just stay in high school, does it? Ooh, it crawls. It crawls into our neighborhoods by way of country clubs, and political yard signs, even parental ideologies. You can tell a person's enemy by the polo that they wear or the bumper sticker on their car. Or even the way they say, oh, well, bless their heart. Mm-hmm, yeah. I got them too. Right? I got enemies as well. You show me someone who's talking about me behind my back or someone's talked poorly about my family and maybe someone even worse, someone wearing a Philadelphia Eagles jersey and it's over for me, right? It's going to be a hard pass. Enemies. <laughs> enemies. Who are those enemies to you? And sometimes they're not even people. They're institutions. They're groups of people. Maybe there's something we can't even see, but we know. But then you add anger into the equation of enemies, and things get messy real quick. Let me ask a bold question. You don't have to raise your hand for this. Actually, don't raise your hand for this. Have you ever had someone wrong you, and you've been consumed with getting them back? Mm-hmm. Yeah, or have you ever had somebody wrong you before? And it's not like you're actively trying to do something to them, but the truth is you're kind of waiting for them to suffer. Mm-hmm. Some of you can't stop from nodding your head a little bit. 
right? Or you hear something bad happens to them and you're kind of like, yes. Something, something within you says, ah, they had it coming. What goes around comes around, yeah. This is called revenge. And anger is kind of like the midwife of revenge, helping birth new understandings and ways for people to get other people what they deserve, especially our enemies. We love being the judge of other people's punishments, don't we? Speaking of judges, um, there's this story in the book of Judges in the Old Testament that comes to mind. It's a ridiculous story. I've talked about it here uh, years ago, so I, but it's, it's very, uh, it feels right to share today. It's, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around the story, in fact. It's a, it's a story about a guy named Samson from the Old Testament. He's in the book of Judges. You might hear, when you hear Samson, you might connect with Delilah, right? This is like a hairy dude who was really strong, right? And Samson comes home one day to go and see his wife, um, and his father-in-law is standing there at the door waiting for him. Now, his, fa- his father-in-law uh, and him have not seen very uh, eye to eye. I know none of you have ever had problems with your in-laws, so this seems foreign to you, uh, right? And so, uh, because one of the reasons is they come from different tribes, right? Samson is an Israelite, right? And then his father-in-law is a Philistine. Ooh, it's like been bad blood there for years upon years. Now, when we talk Old Testament stuff, we have to kind of suspend reality, like women's rights, not a thing, uh, very much so that we know them to be. So this next part is kind of weird. His father-in-law stands in the door, and Samson can't get in, and he says this. This is in the Bible. He says, I was so sure that you hated your wife, my daughter, Samson, so I gave her to your friend. Isn't her younger sister more beautiful? Take her instead. Yikes. Drama, right? Real Housewives of Jerusalem, am I right? Yeah? Did you like that one, Drew? That was for you, buddy. Yeah. I mean, can you, ima- <laughs> can you imagine, though? And what do you think Samson says in that moment? How dare you? How in the world could you do this? What are you thinking? No. Nope. No. Nope. This is what Samson says back. He says, now I have the right to get even with the Philistines. Oh, did you catch that? Like, that's how revenge often starts. And anger comes in and tells us that we have the right to do things that we don't have the right to do. And the madness continues, right? Samson believes he's been wronged, and so he does what any of us would do. He goes out and catches 300 foxes, wraps torches around their tails, and lets them loose through the Philistine camp so it burns up all of their livestock and grain. Because that's what you do, right? I looked online on Google to try and find a picture of it. This is the best picture you can find. This is in the Bible. Some kid colored this, probably. This is wild, right? I mean, this is wild. And we get back to the Philistines, and they find out it's Samson who sent the foxes in. And so they go and find his wife and go and find his father-in-law. And they kill them. They burn their house. They burn them. Their own people. These were Philistines and Philistines. Revenge has the power to do things no matter what the cost. But the line from the whole story, this is one of many, many wild stories, ridiculous stories and judges, is this line at the end in chapter 15, Samson is angry, he's hurt, he's broken, he's mad at the death of his family. And these guys come in, they stop and slow down and say, do you realize what a mess you have done? Stop it right now. Stop the violence. And just before Samson, as the scripture says, goes and kills a thousand Philistines. Hey, by the way, remember when it was just two people? Just two He says this phrase to them. I want us to focus in on this right now. He says this, I merely did to them what they did to me. I merely did to them what they did to me. Revenge always justifies itself morally 
but it defeats the whole golden rule thing that Jesus spoke to. Instead of treating others how we want to be treated, we tend to like, and we're actually better at treating others the ways we've been treated. It's a ridiculous story in the book of Judges, I know. But take a step back and maybe look at some of those brutal inclinations swirling inside of us, and maybe it's not 300 foxes. <laughs> I hope it's not. But we've done things to destroy other people's lives or their success because revenge is sort of what we all know to do. That's why those listeners that day surrounded around Jesus were far more ready to throw stones than take a second to feel with, to show compassion to those we might deem as enemies. Hey, for the record, you need to hear it from me. This is not an easy task to do, okay? It doesn't happen overnight. I'm not asking you to do that. It's hard. But, but take Jesus, for example, right? Paul in Romans, the fifth chapter, he says this phrase. It's a short little phrase. He says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you've heard that before, you're right. We say it every single Sunday right here at the communion table. Right? After we ask for you to go and confess your sins, confess your shortcomings and brokenness to, to God, and we give you a little time for confession. I normally count to eight. Right? Someone came up after church one day and said, I need you to double that for how many sins I got to share, <laughs> how, how much I got to confess. There's that pause. And then we say aloud, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. That proves God's love for us. You know what that means? It, it means that, that there are times in our lives where we act as enemies to God. And yet, God still feels our pain. And God still suffers alongside of us. And God is moved to do something. And that something God did was God sent his son, Jesus, to come and take the blows of our anger like someone who knew they weren't meant for him. He takes all of the blows that we give him, the blows of rage and sorrow and hatred and fear, all that humanity has ever felt. Those blows take him to the cross and nail him upon it, and he dies. And in the end, with our anger on full display, realizing all that we've done, Christ still invites us to fall into the arms of the one we killed to find ourselves saved in his embrace. So friends, as I conclude today, I don't believe Jesus was here to start some sort of social revolution when he's preaching this message, when he's trying to tell them that this is the way that he wants us to identify each other as citizens of the kingdom of God here on earth. It's through compassion. It's through a life of being compassionate, just as our Father in heaven is compassionate to us. And I promise you, I know from experience that the more compassion you show, the less anger will direct the vessel of your soul, which thus stops the cycle of violence back and forth of revenge and moves us to a place where we can finally set our ship towards a direction of truly loving our enemies. And so today, friends, I want you to do this. When you come to the table today, lay down your stones here. You know what they are. Or maybe for some of you, you're like, I can't lay it all the way down, but I'll try to loosen my grip. Let the sticks fall. Stay away from foxes. And listen to the good, ridiculous good news of the gospel. Christ has died for us even while we were sinners. That proves God's love for us. And it goes one step further. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. We are forgiven. Our enemies are forgiven. May it be so. Amen.
Let's pray. Oh, dear God, this was a real tough one today. Um, loving our enemies is like the top of the list of difficult things you're asking us to do. And as people at 930 said, it's good to be reminded. The trouble is I just got to be reminded every day. <laughs> so do we. Reminded every day to love our enemies. And it's not an overnight thing. And that's why we have to hear it and believe it to do good to give people the shirt off our back, to trust and love, and not to look for repayment, but to love someone that's wronged us or hurt us. Doesn't mean we give them a pass. But learning to love goes beyond even that. And it's something that you can only do. You can help us leap over that barrier, whatever's there in front of us. And so today, God, I just ask you, just step by step, as we come forward to this table, that you would help us to loosen our grip and to trust you, to believe that this day and to believe it every day, just a little bit more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.